It's the 2nd of May, 1536, an ordinary spring day for most, but for Queen Anne Boleyn, this day would mark the beginning of the end. A corrupt trial, an unrelenting king, a act of so-called treason. This is the story of how Anne lost her head. I'm Victoria, and welcome to this episode of Renaissance Ghost. Anne and Henry VIII were the great romantics Their love was true and everlasting, so strong that Henry would change the entire country just so he could call Anne his wife. But in the three short years they were married, on the 2nd of May, Anne would be left with only 17 days to live. On Henry's orders, he wanted her gone. The troubles began three months previous. On the 28th of January, tragically, Anne miscarried a son, This son was her lifeline. Her tragedy is what sealed her fate. All of Henry's doubts over their marriage came flooding back and his patience had run out. He was desperate for an heir. That's why he fought so hard to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, in the first place. All he wanted was a son to carry on his lineage. But he believed, and I quote, that God did not permit them to have a son. Rumours were already circulating that he might take another wife. It was this day in January that Henry decided to leave Anne for someone who will give him a son. Thomas Cromwell, the king's special advisor, famously promising to make Henry the richest sovereign that ever reigned in England, is tasked with permanently getting rid of Anne. He has spent weeks remorselessly preparing and plotting a case against her. Cromwell despises Anne. If he were to fail, it would be his head on the line instead. In Tudor England, at any moment, all your power could be taken. One wrong move and it all crumbles. The game was constant. To upset the king was to risk your life. Cromwell knew he must succeed. At 8am on Tuesday the 2nd of May 1536, a message sent by Henry across London to Placentia Palace, Greenwich, where Anne is staying, would change everything. Anne started the day watching tennis as normal. Usually she would have done so with Henry. But the day before at the May Day joust, Henry suddenly and abruptly, after speaking with an advisor, left Anne without warning for one of his palaces at Whitehall. I imagine this would have been quite alarming for her. While watching the tennis match that morning, the message arrived. The instruction, by order of the king, Anne must present herself to the Privy Council at Greenwich. The Privy Council being Henry's most important advisers. Alarm bells must have started firing. Anne would have known how serious this was. The first stage of Cromwell's plan was about to be enacted. Anne had many enemies at court. She was known as the great whore, the concubine. She is the woman who has ripped Britain apart, who has ousted the most beloved Queen Catherine. For anyone who might have supported Anne, there were many, many more who would rather see her fall. So I can imagine she must have felt as though she was about to walk into the lion's den. Anne was escorted from the tennis courts to a council chamber at the other side of the complex, walking in full view of everyone, which would have been absolutely humiliating and set tongues wagging. At the council chamber, she was met with three members, including the Duke of Norfolk, her own uncle, although the two couldn't stand each other, as well as William Kingston, the constable of the Tower of London. Anne claimed she was cruelly handled by the men, with Norfolk saying tut, tut, tut in her face. Anne was presented before them and charged for adultery with Sir Henry Norris, Mark Smeaton, a musician at court, and at this moment an unnamed third man. This was a complete shock and surprise almost plucked from nowhere. Until this moment, Anne would have believed that all was well and happy. There was no prior indication of anything like this happening. Anne immediately stated that she is the king's true wife and no other man has ever touched her. She remained calm and protested her innocence throughout, 
before being escorted under guard back to her room, forced to cross the palace in full view of everyone yet again, who by now were gossiping and whispering all around her. This act alone giving real insight into the viciousness of this plan to bring her down. The humiliation she had had to walk through twice now was plainly cruel. Once back at her rooms, Anne did her best to carry on her day as she normally would. She sat down to dinner, dressed in red velvet and gold, trying to maintain appearances. She was still queen, almost a sense of denial of what's happening around her. But her ladies started acting strangely. They started getting upset and tearful. The king's waiter would usually come in every day as she would eat her dinner to say, much good may it do you on behalf of the king. But on this day, he would never come. And that was what eventually started to break her calm demeanour. The distress starts to peek through. Something is gravely wrong and everyone knows it. Cromwell started to make his way to Greenwich, along with a large number of important and noble men, including Anne's uncle, who was carrying the warrant for her arrest. They entered her dining room and, rising from her seat, we came by the king's command to conduct the Lady Anne to the Tower of London. This must have truly rocked her core. But she stays composed and held together, replying, If it be his majesty's pleasure, then I am ready to obey. She was given no time to pack or summon her ladies. She wasn't even allowed to say goodbye to her then two-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, which must have really broke her heart. Even worse than this, Anne would never get the chance to say goodbye. She would never see her daughter again. Cromwell needed her gone quick. Henry and Anne had always had furious rows, but the key is that they would always make up in the end. By acting fast and keeping her away, he's making sure that Henry won't change his mind. Changing his mind now would put Cromwell in grave danger. Henry, meanwhile, was keeping a low profile in Whitehall, hiding, some may even say. The few people who saw him that day said he was rejoicing and in great spirits, as well as holding feasts and banquets one after the other and dining with ladies, remaining with them until after midnight in the days that followed. Not trying too hard to hide his delight. Anne was escorted by Cromwell to the beach on the River Thames. The boat would have been waiting there to take her to the tower. Usually, prisoners are taken under cover of darkness, but Anne is taken in broad daylight. They want to make her arrest public and as humiliating as possible. The rivers were really busy central places back then, filled with boats, people working, and just, you know, crowds, people meeting up, doing their washing. They were the hustle and bustle. And these people had now become hostile spectators. She was never popular. Most of the public still thought of Catherine as queen, not Anne. The abuse she must have heard, the roars from the crowd. I can't imagine how she must have felt, how truly horrendous this slow two-hour journey down the river must have been for her. Meanwhile, Cromwell's agents were spreading the word that the Queen of England had been arrested and like wildfire. Within hours, everyone in London would have known. A certain other rumour about who the mystery third man was started circulating pretty quickly as well. Rumour had it that Anne had been having an affair with her own brother, George Boleyn. Although this would still be unknown to Anne, George had heard and immediately raced across London to Whitehall Palace to see the king and plead his innocence. But Cromwell wouldn't let anyone near Henry. He was blocked off. Whether this was Henry's demand or Cromwell's is anyone's guess, but George was arrested on the spot and charged with incest. Most prisoners enter the tower through Traitor's Gate, but as Anne arrives, she was taken through the court gates. She is still Queen of England, and at this moment was being shown the respect of one. Cannons would have been firing all around her as she entered, which must have been terrifying because she fell to her knees, protesting her innocence. 
Anne was passed over to William Kingston, the constable, asking him, do I go to the dungeon? But to her shock, she was taken to the lavish Queen's apartments, the same ones Henry had spent one and a half million pounds on three years before in preparation for her coronation. I would like to think that this would have brought her some relief and reassurance that maybe Henry was just punishing her and it would all be over soon. But really, this must have been so confusing. Why arrest and humiliate her, then present her with a glimmer of hope and comfort? When she saw the apartments, Anne cried out, It is too good for me. Throughout the day, Kingston said Anne fell down weeping in her place and then fell into great laughing. She has done so many times. The shock, the pain, the fear had driven Anne into hysterics. The not knowing. She really must have been truly terrified. Anne was appointed four ladies, all of whom she didn't like or trust, all acting as spies to Cromwell, including her own aunt. Family loyalty is nothing in pursuit of power to the Boleyns. The problem is, Cromwell didn't have enough evidence to get rid of Anne just yet. Adultery on its own would have only been enough for a divorce, so he was hoping she would incriminate herself in the tower with his spies watching her every move. Anne always insists on her innocence. I am the king's true wedded wife, she had told the constable. My kingston, do you know wherefore I am here, she asked him, and he simply replied, no. Anne then demanded to know where her father was, and here, in my opinion, is the worst truth, the most horrendous fact in all of this. Her own father had abandoned her to save himself. Cromwell is moving to the next step of his plan. He needed to take all of Anne's supporters, especially those who might hold power, and get in the way of proceedings. He is preparing for a trial that will not only remove Anne, but also anyone who shows her favour. He needs something definite that can't be argued. The last thing anyone wants is a mess like the last time Henry tried to get out of his marriage. That took seven years. Henry didn't have seven years. He wanted Anne gone right now. Interestingly, Cromwell sent a message to Henry letting him know what had happened that day and listing the allegations against Anne. Witnesses said upon reading this, the king began to weep. I believe this was a complete show. After all, he is the one who commanded her removal three months ago. He knew the arrest was happening, which is why he left her alone the day before, which is why he was hiding on the other side of London. Yet he acted like this was a complete shock to him. All this happened in one day. That Tuesday, the 2nd of May. But the worst for Anne hadn't even begun. Try me, good king, but let me have a lawful trial, and let not my sworn enemies sit as my accusers and judges, for my truth shall fear no open shame. Anne pleaded to Henry in a letter, but the outcome of the trial was already set in stone. Thirteen days after her arrest, Anne was called to trial. The trial lasted only one day. It was on the 15th of May, 1536, within the Great Hall at the Tower of London, that Anne learned of her fate. The most important men in the kingdom gathered to watch her trial, including Cromwell, who was overseeing it, of course. He had selected the judge and jury personally to ensure they would all side with him and the king. Most of them were people who hated Anne. Her own uncle Norfolk was to be the judge, and to make matters worse, her own father sat on the jury as well as 26 others. Cromwell really did go that extra mile to try and destroy Anne's spirit. If these men hadn't sided with Henry, they risked their lives, estates, fortunes, families. The fear attached to being a part of this court was colossal. Everything Cromwell had done was against Anne. Her chances were non-existent. Members of the public were allowed to watch. 2,000 gathered inside this one hall to witness the Queen of England fight for her life. The atmosphere would have been chaotic, loud and intimidating. Anne was led in, followed by the jailer and her four ladies. 
Spectators, however, said she never looked more in control. She didn't flinch even once, even at the sight of her own father on the jury. She wasn't about to give these men the satisfaction of watching her crumble. In fact, she was so calm and held together that she actually managed to calm the crowd. At this point, Anne still didn't know exactly what she's being accused of. To her knowledge, she was there on the charges of having an adulterous affair with three men, one still unnamed. But she soon learned the shocking truth. The details of her charges were listed as adultery with four men, Sir Henry Norris, Sir William Brereton, Sir Francis Weston and Mr Mark Smeaton. It is claims she despised her marriage for three years, undermining the king's status and dignity. She is accused of 20 acts of adultery altogether, incest with her brother George, which the record described in great detail, even stating Anne encouraged her brother, alluring him with her tongue. There were allegations of witchcraft. She was shown as a woman who had no control over her passions or body. The allegations of incest were all based on a letter Anne had written to George telling him she was pregnant, which Cromwell concluded this surely meant the child was George's. Weak, to say the least. It is recorded Anne and George made fun of Henry's clothes and poetry behind his back, humiliating the king and plotting against him. But this isn't all. Cromwell even managed to bring in a witness George's wife, Lady Rochford, who stood against the Boleyns and confirmed the incest. Nobody knows why she did this. We know Lady Rochford and George had a deeply unhappy marriage. Perhaps she was out to get her husband or saw this as an opportunity for divorce. But either way, it was quite earth shattering. Lady Rochford, of course, would go on to be lady-in-waiting for both Jane Seymour and Catherine Howard. Upon hearing all these allegations for the first time in court that day, Anne stayed serene, certain of her innocence, believing God will intervene and bring justice. She never even flinched. Eyewitnesses state she was unmoved. She said little. No one to look at her would have thought her guilty. The atmosphere shifted. People are starting to shift into Anne's favour. She was a highly intelligent woman, educated abroad, standing apart as someone who champions the role of women. Anne fights off the evidence brought against her. She defends herself with wisdom and discretion, so much so that people are sympathising with her. She is fighting for her life and winning, at least in the eyes of the 2,000 spectators. This really does speak to how remarkable she was. Her character, her perseverance, the fact she could hold her own against these highly educated men, that she could shift an atmosphere despite not being allowed any witnesses or people to contest her side. It was her against everyone else. Adultery was a crime that would have exiled Anne to a convent and called for divorce, but not to make Anne disappear permanently. Cromwell needed more, a serious charge, something so serious there was no coming back. Cromwell read the final charge against her, high treason. He declared that he discovered Anne had plotted the death of the king with evidence from Henry Norris, one of the men she was accused of having an affair with. A couple of weeks before, Anne had asked Norris why he hadn't proposed to her cousin Lady Shelton yet. He replied that he was going to wait and see, to which Anne then said, You look for dead men's shoes. If out should come to the king but good, you would look to have me. This may have been meant in jest, but this simple remark was all it took to implicate Anne in plotting Henry's death. High treason, punishable only by death. Still, even hit with the sudden realisation that this is far more serious than she could ever have thought, Anne sat calmly, unmoved. Fifteen days prior to Anne's trial, the men accused of sleeping with her, apart from her brother, had been interrogated. 
All the nobles totally denied the charges, but Mark Smeaton, a commoner, cracks. He claims Anne singles him out for special attention and that she seduced him, making love to him on three occasions. He was brutally interrogated for 24 hours. The account reading. Then he called two stout young fellows of his, referring to Cromwell, and asked for a rope and cudgel and ordered them to put the rope which was full of knots around Mark's head and twisted it with the cudgel until Mark cried out, Mr. Secretary, no more, I will tell the truth. Torture was a legal way of getting confessions out of people, but it wasn't allowed to be used on nobility, only on commoners. It's almost as if Smeaton had to be placed as an accused to get a confession. You have to question the validity of his confession. Did something actually happen or was he just trying to stop the pain? Anne would have constantly been surrounded by her ladies. She was queen. She was never alone. She had no privacy. To conduct a secret affair would have been near impossible. On the 12th of May, three days before Anne's trial, Henry Norris, William Brereton, Francis Weston and Mark Smeaton were tried and found guilty of adultery with the Queen. There are no surviving records of the trial, only eyewitness accounts, which state, They have violated and had carnal knowledge of the said Queen, each person at different times. They, like Anne, were allowed no witnesses testifying for them. They couldn't even defend themselves. They were only allowed to declare innocent or guilty. They all said not guilty except for Mark Smeaton, who confesses he had cardinal knowledge of the Queen three times. Their sentence was to be hung, drawn and quartered, then their members cut off and burnt before them. The executions were postponed until after Anne's trial, and so the four men returned to the dungeons in the Tower of London. Back at Anne's trial, all the evidence presented had been questionable to say the least. But as her uncle sent the jury away to decide the verdict, within only a few minutes they came back with a unanimous decision. Anne is found guilty of high treason of all the charges. She was immediately stripped of her crown and titles. Norfolk delivers her sentence. She will be burned or beheaded at the king's pleasure. Her own father had just helped to sign his daughter's death warrant. Anne has just found out she is going to die, but she doesn't flinch. The room becomes chaotic and loud, roars erupt like it's a concert, but her composure doesn't crack even for a second. She has shown no fear or dismay. She simply stands and says, I do not say that I have always borne towards the king the humility to which I owed him, considering the great honour and respect he has always shown me. I admit too that often I have taken into my own head to be jealous of him, but may God be my witness if I have ever done him any other wrong. The cannons Henry had been waiting for were fired, the signal that Anne was found guilty, and Anne is taken back to the tower. She is the first queen to ever be sentenced to death, to ever be charged with high treason. Her brother George was escorted into the hall shortly after her. He is also found guilty and taken back to the tower to prepare for death. Neither of them stood a chance, even to the standards of the day. This court was a farce. The day after the trial, the 16th of May, Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is a firm supporter of Anne and close friend and confidant, grants Cromwell's request to null and void Anne and Henry's marriage, declaring Elizabeth, their daughter, a bastard, stripping her of her household and titles. It is said Cranmer was shocked and distraught on hearing Anne's charges, even writing to Henry himself to say he was amazed, for I had never a better opinion of woman. But this would make absolutely no difference to Henry or Anne's situation. On the 17th of May, the five men Anne was accused of having an affair with were brought up to Tower Hill for their execution. Henry had decided they could have a more merciful death of beheading rather than hung, drawn and quartered, 
with George Boleyn going first as he was the highest rank. Anne would have been able to see them being led up the hill for their execution and the bodies being brought back to the tower. She watched her own brother being taken to die and then his bloody, headless corpse be brought back. I cannot imagine how torturous this must have been and how sick to her stomach she must have felt. The next day, the 18th of May, Anne was due to be executed. She was going to be the first person to be executed inside the walls of the tower, a private affair without the view of the general public. Cromwell wanted her executed as quickly as possible, Anne was ready to die. She had dressed and taken communion, I imagine braced herself, but all in vain, because the execution was postponed twice, first to later that day, then to the next. Perhaps she believed Henry was having second thoughts, that he was going to swoop in and save her last minute that she had suffered enough. But in actuality, they were waiting for the executioner to arrive after being delayed in his journey from France. You see, Henry, and I quote... We, moved by pity, not wishing the Lady Anne to be burned, will have her head cut from her body. He had not only ordered for a beheading, but a French death by sword rather than axe. By hiring an expert swordsman, Henry showed a meek sense of mercy or perhaps a small amount of guilt on his part. A sword will be a lot quicker and less painful, an axe could take several blows to kill you. Anne, on hearing this, joked, putting her hands around her neck, saying it will be a swift death because I have just a little neck. Henry would have had to send for the swordsman at least six days in advance, if not more, in order for Anne to be executed on the 18th. But the verdict was only given five days ago. The swordsman was hired long before Anne even stood trial. Henry wanted her dead, nothing would stop him, and there is no plainer evidence than this. The 19th of May, 1536, was the day Anne was beheaded. She was laughing and joking with her ladies before, the constable reporting, her mood swings between despair and hope. To my knowledge, this lady has much joy and pleasure in death. I think she had accepted her fate and chosen not to feel afraid, but to try and make light in her last few hours. Her now distraught ladies-in-waiting dressed her. She carefully had chosen each item of clothing. She was wearing a red underdress, typical of a commoner, with a black English-style gown over top, much more subdued than her typical glamour. Anne is known for her extravagant French style of dressing, with expensive imported fabrics. But that day she dressed down, maybe to appear humble, to show her innocence, or just simply to look as a person of England. The execution was supposed to be private, but the gates had accidentally been left open. Now a huge crowd of 1,000 people had come in to watch, including her uncle, Thomas Cromwell, and all the men who had wished to see her brought down. Even Henry Fitzroy, the king's illegitimate son, was there to watch. Kingston arrived to collect Anne. He tells her to make ready, to which she replied, Quit yourself of your charge, for I have long been prepared. Anne is extremely brave and showed the greatest courage of anyone I have ever read about. I can't imagine how terrified she must have been, but this was a woman with fire in her veins. She was going to stand strong until the very end. Anne was led out, accompanied by her four ladies, followed by 200 members of the King's Guard and her chaplain. She left the tower and walks to the scaffold. The once bellowing crowd hushed. People commented that she had never looked more beautiful as she walked towards her fate through the courtyard. It is said she looked around a lot, almost waiting or hoping that a message would arrive from the king, that last-minute pardon, something which would never come. She climbs the scaffold and turns to her weeping ladies, comforting them. She may not have liked or trusted them, and they may have been Cromwell's spies, but they wept for the woman before them. 
I think in the end they all came round to her. The executioner had hidden his sword underneath the straw to not alarm Anne. She asked for permission to speak and smiling she addressed the crowd. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, for according to the law and by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die, but I pray God save the king and send him long reign over you. For a gentler nor more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle on my cause, I require them to judge the best, and thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me, to God I condemn my soul. Anne's words would reduce the crowd to tears. A humble speech. She was then invited to confess the truth, to which she replied, I know I shall have no pardon, but they shall know no more from me, contesting her innocence until her last breath. The swordsman takes off his shoes so she won't hear him approach. Anne removes her headdress and puts on a linen cap, tucking her hair in so it won't be in the way. The executioner kneeled before her and asks her forgiveness, which she grants. After being blindfolded and kneeling at the block, she repeats several times, To Jesus Christ I commend my soul. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. The executioner picked up his sword, the crowd falling completely silent, and in one strike, Anne Boleyn was dead. Cannons fire as her head falls to the straw on the scaffold. Anne's ladies refuse to let any man touch her, and together carry her body and head into the tower. No coffin was prepared for Anne. She had to be laid in an arrow chest, which would have been a very slim, narrow box. She was brought to the chapel of the tower, where her clothing and jewellery were removed. Almost unbelievably, these were given to Jane Seymour by Henry himself, which is one of the most stomach-churning facts from this whole ordeal. Anne was buried next to her brother George and finally at peace. In just 17 days, the Queen of England had lost her life and just two weeks later, Henry would go on to marry Jane Seymour. Cromwell and Henry had won. <laughs>